Thank you for being here, Dan. It's um, I'm looking forward to learning more about electrical, and I think everybody on here is too, because I think there'll be some questions that will be um, answered that maybe they've been in our minds for a long time. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Uh, welcome, everybody. And um, hopefully I'll touch on some things that uh, everybody has some questions on and those kinds of things that come up from time to time. And uh, like I say, if you have any questions or anything, put them uh, down in that chat. And then um, I'm sure CC will get them to me so I can maybe uh, answer them and those kinds of things for everybody and um, and whatnot. But uh, I'm, I'm Dan Kegley, so I, I am the owner and inspector for REM Inspecting out of Amory, Wisconsin, so in the northwest corner of Wisconsin. And uh, I'm a contracted DSPS uh, inspection agency for the for the state. Um, I cover 16 counties, so I cover everything from um, pretty much um, almost to Rhinelander, um, north and south, all the way to the all the way to the water, Minnesota kind of side. So all 16 counties in, in there and everything. So um, so what I thought I would do is uh, maybe uh, share some, I think the PowerPoint that maybe CC has shared before, a little bit uh, covers a little bit about some of the electrical there. We'll have some discussion there and then I'll bring up some of the code uh, uh, sections that I have up here to talk about some items there. Um, and then some uh, current drawings I found from uh, Zoller and those kinds of things with some pretty good description of the wiring and ceiling and those kinds of things. So with that... Uh, Dan, here. while you're sharing your screen, I just want to mention something. It does say that your bandwidth is low, so you may want to stop um, your video while you're okay. sharing your screen, just because it might kind of mess things up. There you go. Cut out. Yep, sounds good. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Switch over to Well, I'm going to try this first. Yeah, it looks like we're seeing your screen. Okay, sounds good. And I'm gonna to try to kick off this PowerPoint here. What we're seeing right now, yep, there you go, you got her. All right, sounds good. So obviously uh, SPS 316 is the uh, State Electrical Code uh, Volume 2. I don't know if everybody knew this or not, but there's two electrical volumes. Volume 1 is uh, Public Service Commission 114, PSC 114. Um, primarily deals with uh, utility uh, interconnections and transmission lines and those kinds of things. Uh, and then PSC or SPS uh, 316 covers all of the premise wiring. So uh, basically uh, PSC 114 covers all the wiring up to like the service meter socket and that kind of thing. And then everything after the meter socket to the anything on the premise is considered uh, premise wiring under SPS 316. And DSPS uh, is the one that inspects everything under SPS 316. And then as we can see here, um, 316.300, uh, 1.a kind of covers a little bit about the um, electrical wiring of uh, the PAUT systems. Um, so the minimum burial depth uh, is listed here is 24 inches using cable rated for direct burial. So even your low voltage cabling has to be listed for direct buried. So I, I know a lot of times I find that uh, people use CAT6 cable or they use um, some other two wire, three wire phone cable. Um, that's just a standard cable and it should really be a a direct cable, direct bury cable. It'll say right on the outside of the cabling uh, to be installed for direct burial cabling. Uh, obviously, what happens with the other stuff is it breaks down over time underground, and then you uh, get either faults or it doesn't work altogether. Um, let's see here. Wanted to share this quickly with you, so I'm going to switch over to this guy. So this is the actual code itself uh, under Article 300. Um, this is Table 300.5, minimum, minimum cover requirement uh, as listed for zero to 1,000 volts uh, nominal. And if you look at that, um, 
basically the chart says uh, basically under column one, direct burial cable or conductors. And then on the left-hand side, you can basically all locations not specified below is 24 inches, which is what's listed there. Uh, but a lot of times we end up putting a pelt system in, you know, one and two family backyard kind of scenario. And if you look at that table down below, the minimum burial depth is actually, it can be 18 inches for a one and two family dwelling. Um, and then of course it goes under roads and streets and buildings and those kinds of things, uh, concrete slabs and whatnot. So there's kind of a theme here. If you look at 18 inches and 24 inches is pretty much the two primary depths there. So when in doubt, I'd say put it at 24 inches and you'll, you'll always be by in the code reference if you're on 24 inches. Uh, back to uh, this guy here. That's good to know. <clears throat> There's just, when you're, when you're showing that <laughs> article 300 there, that's a lot of stuff to remember. <laughs> <laughs> there is, uh, and that's just a small portion of it too. So that was a quick synopsis. There's obviously quite a bit in Article 300 where it talks about, um, um, I guess I could bring that up back again here, because uh, direct berry, direct berry, anything that comes out of the ground, um, because we have frost up here in the north, northern parts of Wisconsin here, um, that frost heaving can actually uh, take a conduit that's in contact with the earth and basically shove it up into whatever it's fixed to, uh, like a building or a post um, and those kinds of things. And so the code requires a compensation for that. And let's see if I can bring that back up here. I'll go back to sharing and I'll just share this back again. Where did it go? Let's see, I think I'm already screen sharing this one, this one, this one. Let's see if I can get it here and here. And we're still sharing. It. There, we're seeing that now. Seeing it now? Okay. Yep, yeah, we're seeing Article 300. So if we go to uh, 300, uh, and then if we go to 300.5, which is where you're going to find all your underground installations, um, we just looked at the minimum cover requirement in 300.5a. It goes into uh, wet locations, underground cables and conductors under buildings. So there's quite a bit here. And then if we follow through kind of, um, let's see, D is protecting protection from damage. Um, E is splices and taps and direct berry conductors can be done, backfilling. So we gotta make sure you have good backfill and not have the rocks and things that can damage cables and conduits. Uh, raceway seals, um, kind of where it wants to keep that uh, in the ground moisture from rising up into the pipes and condensing out into the conduits and stuff, which causes problems with the moisture laying inside the conduits. Uh, due to the moisture from the ground. Um, bushings uh, on the end of the conduit, so on top and bottom of the conduit, so even though you have a straight piece of conduit that's cut off and stuck in the ground, it still asks for a nice rounded uh, end bushing to be put on there because as the frost, as the ground moves, and believe it or not, the ground does move, it actually pulls on those cables and cords and connectors and it will actually wear on the end of the edge of the pipe. So I want you to use a cord a bushing on the end of it. Um, there's several different styles of bushings that can be used. Um, lots of products out there, but basically they have a nice smooth uh, end to it. Here's a couple pictures of a sealed bushing on the, the end to seal it. Um, is it pre-manufactured? Actually, we'll look at a Zoller. Um, Zoller has a uh, product that's very similar to this for their uh, cords that come through. Um, here's a picture uh, basically showing that 18 inch minimum here, like in a residential scenario, and then a protective bushing on the end with that UF cable that comes so, in to feed that pump. So you'll have that UF cable coming in. So is what you're saying here, I'm just looking at these images, um, Dan, and mm -hmm. when any time a wire comes up and comes into that conduit, we should have this bushing there uh, or some kind of a seal for it to go through, or can it just be an open pipe? 
correct. Um, it does say it can be sealed at either end. So it can be sealed either at the ground level there, or it could be sealed at the top exactly. where it comes into the box itself. But it needs um, a seal. It needs a seal. A lot of times, like when I'm doing installations, I'll use a product called uh, Duck Seal. It's a putty kind of material. It's kind of a grayish putty looking material. It's used in a lot of uh, HVAC duct work. That's why they call it duct seal. And it's uh, basically a nice little clay putty type material that you just pack around the conductors at the top of the box as it comes into that junction box. And then that'll keep that moist air that's from the ground in that conduit. And if it does condense out, it'll just go back into the ground. All right. But it won't condense out inside the box causing you know, corrosion on your connectors and fittings and that kind of thing. And then, of course, the bushing itself protects the wire as that ground, as that wire gets moved around from the ground movement, um, it helps keep it from biting into the, the edge of that conduit, if you will. Right. Um, so it shows basically the end of the conduit bushing going down 18 inches, and then the cable itself is actually down 24 inches. Um, but you can have that depth be 18 inches if you're in a residential scenario um, kind of thing. And then this would we usually go down 12 inches. If it's in like a residential scenario, you go 12 inches into the ground and then 18 inches for your cable depth um, kind of in that residential scenario. Um, and then they do show a fitting here where they actually have a, kind of like a, a elbow on it um, with a protective bushing on the end of that elbow kind of thing. So another methodology, you can have it either straight down into the ground or you can actually put an elbow down underneath. And then of course they have a concrete pad here showing a two inch depth there. Um, then it goes into I, conductors the same circuits. Um, then J is where we talk about that earth movement. This is where direct buried conductors, raceways or cables are subject to movement by settlement or frost, then the direct buried conductors, raceways, or cables shall be arranged so as to prevent damage to ensure to the enclosed conductors to or to equipment connected to the raceway. Um, again, that's where we have like a junction box. It's not going to move, but you'll have the ground pushing up on that raceway, trying to push it up on that box that's not moving, causing damage. Or I've actually seen it actually pull that and do it right out of the box and then expose the wires. Huh. Makes sense. And so expansion fittings can be used, uh, slip sleeves can be used. Um, so there's, there's a variation of products that, can, that are out there that can be used to help compensate for that, that earth movement. Um, yeah, so there's a little tidbit on that because uh, sometimes we don't see that um, very well when they, they just cut a piece of conduit and stick it in the ground and kind of walk away. Well, they should have like a slip sleeve, which can be like the next size conduit up that actually goes into the ground. Oh, so if cool. this was a two inch, um, two inch conduit going into the ground, you could basically stop at ground level with that two inch and you could have like a two and a half inch in the ground, say 12 to 18 inches. And then this two inch will just slide inside that two and a half inch that's in the ground. Um, yeah, we which is have that basically a slip sleeve. <laughs> We have that, we call it a frost sleeve that we put on our clean outs that come above grade. And that makes sense. Then the frost yep. grabs that and, and moves that. And exactly. That. Yeah. Exactly. Yep, uh, frost one, sleeves. Yep. One question that did come up is, um, does the burial depth apply to both high voltage and low voltage wires? So let's just say we're running an alarm wire for a holding tank. Does that 24 inches or 18 inches apply to, to those wires as well? It does. Uh, if we go back up to this uh, chart here, it says zero volts to a thousand volts. Oh, okay, so if, gotcha. even if there's zero volts in that cable, it applies to that cable. Gotcha. Yep. So right. when, when you say low voltage and high voltage, whether it's a 12 volt or 24 volt control circuit, or if it's a 120 volt line circuit, um, or a 240 volt pump circuit, um, this is zero to a thousand volts. Gotcha. Okay, um, so that kind of covers a little bit about that and maybe that frost sleeve and that bushing uh, on the end of the conduit. Um, another note is that this is a, a PVC conduit, not a PVC plumbing pipe. 
So you got to make sure you're installing wires inside, you know, the gray conduit and not inside the white PVC pipe. Um, the code does require uh, those um, conduits or raceways to be um, electrical PVC conduit. That's good to know. We see that happen quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Is, uh, rigid metal conduit minimum burial is six inches. Um, if you notice back in the, in the thing, it didn't matter what type of product you're using. So even if you're using metal conduit, you'd still have to go down to the same burial depth. So if we go back to that chart, let's see if I can get back to that. So it says, uh, well, these, this is specific to direct burial. Then it says rigid metal conduit here in column two or intermediate metal conduit. So you have rigid metal or intermediate IMC um, or RMC. Um, like if we go back down to where we looked at um, one and two family dwellings, you see 18 inches again. So it didn't matter if you had a, just the cable, the UF cable or the steel conduit, it's still 18 inch burial depth, whether you had rigid metal conduit or had that cable, um, it's still 18 inches. Same thing, 24 inches. Um, there are some exceptions here. You can see the location is not specified below. You can get six inches below depth um, in trenches um, below uh, with two inches of concrete, you know, six inches versus 18 inches. So there are some exceptions here, uh, but you got to look at the chart here. So it's not quite as just the same as the 18 and 24 like you would find just with the cable itself. Um, yeah, there's a lot of variability there. So yeah, there you is. just put, put it at 24 inches. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then like if you had PVC where column three is non-metallic raceway listed for direct burial without concrete. So that would be your PVC conduits that's going into the ground. Um, without encasement, um, you know, here again, 18 inches, uh, 12 inches, 4 inches. But when you get back down to the residential, so pretty much if you're in any kind of the residential scenario, whether you have just the cable, steel, or PVC, it's 18, 18, and 18. So 18 inches is pretty much the magic number if you're at a residential facil facility with a one and two family dwelling. Um, So, um, stuff. get back, back to here. So that here. chart in the slides that says how deep it should be, it really doesn't apply because <laughs> everything can just vary so much. And It, yeah. it can vary. Mm -hmm. But I think the key there is if you're in a residential scenario, it's 18 inches across the board. So yep. that's the key thing there. Um, like I say, if you're, if you're not at a residential facility and you're not sure, 24 inches is the... The when in doubt, put a 24 kind of thing. Uh, however, there are exceptions to, to go less if you could follow the chart. Um, using the correct gauge of cable wiring for loads and distances. Um, obviously, your usually your 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 fractional horsepower pumps, you know, we're only going to need a either a 14 gauge, 14 2 uh, gauge wire or a 12 2 wire. However, if you are going longer distances, um, you do need to compensate for voltage drop. Um, the code does talk about 3% and 5%. Uh, basically, it says if you're in a branch circuit, so going from, uh, say, your circuit breaker to feed your pump, um, it wants a maximum drop of three, no more than 3% voltage drop um, between that circuit breaker and then that pump kind of thing. Um, and then it can be up to 5% if it's the total load of the circuit going in. So that would be like if you had a feeder going to a sub panel, going to the device at the very far end. So you could combine the total of the two into 5% if you have going into multiple different boxes in different scenarios there. Um, but you need to consider that. And so you might have to upsize 
So say if a, a 14.2 is going to get you the right amperage for running that motor, but the distance is longer than what it can do for that 3% voltage drop, then you might have to bump it up to like a 12.2 UF or something like that, or even a 10.2 UF. Yeah, and there are calculators uh, out there that I that we've provided to um, help people know that because sometimes our, our pump tanks actually over time have gotten further and further away from the house it seems like and so yeah um, they were running that that wire a lot further distance and we so one option is to um is to put in a larger cable um another option is to go instead of a, a 120 pump we can do a 240 pump and then we draw half as many amps and so some guys do that they'll put in that larger pump so that they don't need that load so Sure, sure. And now with smartphones out there, there's several different apps out there that, that are really useful for calculating it out right on your, right on your smartphone there too. Um, I use an app called uh, Electrician's Bible, which is very helpful. It talks about uh, voltage drops. It talks, talks about their burial depths. It basically has a wealth of information there right at your fingertips. So if you need to look something up, you can, you can certainly do that. Um, but Electrician Bible, um, I just went to my, um, I've got an Android app, but I just went to the, to uh, the Android and downloaded the, the electrician's Bible and it had a lot of good information there. Good to know. Um, and then the same thing goes for alarms too. Um, however, alarms are a little different scenario because you don't have a constant load like you would on a motor. Uh, alarm is really just closing a circuit to create an alarm circuit to activate and create a, a sound or a light kind of thing. So um, you don't have to be quite as uh, picky. The 3% the voltage drop really doesn't apply to that because there's really no load there because you're just closing a circuit to create a voltage circuit path to create the, the circuit to know that something's going on there. So you can that's why you can get away with kind of the, the lower voltage two wire, three wire cable uh, out there. Um, Usually when you install your alarm system, the, the, the installation instructions provide a lot of good information with the size of conductors to use and the distance. They've kind of already done the engineering for that uh, within the installation instructions, um, which is one of the requirements of the National Electric Code. Basically it says, you know, you have to comply with the installation instructions uh, of the product. Um, the pump and alarm must be on separate circuits, so you can't put them on the same circuit breaker. So basically you have to have two different circuit breakers, uh, circuit power sources, so that if the pump kicks out the breaker, the alarm's still going to go off kind of thing. So the pump must be on its own circuit and the alarm itself must be on a separate circuit. Um, neutral conductors cannot be shared, so you can't run a um, a multi-circuit wire out there for both the alarm and and the pump. Um, all junction boxes must be listed for wet locations. Uh, NEMA 3 is the minimum here. Uh, I've noticed in like the Zoller and some of the other ones, they uh, basically are putting in a, a NEMA 4 enclosure. And basically the difference between a NEMA 3 is a NEMA 3 is just a rain tight uh, enclosure. So it basically will keep the rain out of it kind of thing. Where a NEMA 4 enclosure is more of a, a dust tight enclosure. So it'll actually keep uh, dust and debris from getting in there and collecting on, on the connectors and, and those kinds of things. So the NEMA 4 uh, junction boxes um, are, are definitely a better box to use just because of that keeping the dust out and those kinds of things. Um, but NEMA 3 will work. So there's nothing, nothing wrong with the NEMA 3. Um, and then conduit openings into the tank or manhole risers uh, must be watertight and are generally cast in place by the manufacturer. Um, so obviously when they're making the tanks, they're gonna have the pre-made holes there for those discharge to go through and, and then obviously the electrical. Um, so here's a picture of kind of the mechanical conduits and things like that. As we just described there, though, the uh, depth for the mechanical or for the metal, sorry, the metal 
conduit PV sign or the PVC or just the cable. Um, we've got that 18 inches minimum for residential, uh, 24 when in doubt, and it can be less depending on the circumstances in that table, uh, 300. Um, and then of course, the bushings on the end, like we talked about earlier. Um, and then like a, a frost sleeve or expansion fitting or slip sleeve uh, to protect from that frost movement. Um, so you can see here, um, there's just wiring hanging out and those kinds of things. Definitely not the way to have a good installation there. Uh, just having a receptacle hanging out inside the woods there where you can get all those mud daubers. I don't know if you're familiar with mud daubers, but they'll fill all those little receptacle holes up with their eggs and things, and you won't be able to plug anything in there. And it also does create a, a shorting hazard uh, because it, mud daubers will get in there and create a circuit path. Oh, another thing to note is uh, on the top right here, they have the rain we, they have the rainproof covers here for this double receptacle here um, on the top right picture there. Uh, the state of Wisconsin has adopted that uh, you have to have an in-use cover installed on all outdoor receptacles. So if you're going to be installing a receptacle outdoors, it has to have an in-use cover, which is a bubble cover as a kind of a... A, a terminology we use. Um, so it's a basically, a, it can be a, a, it has to be a hard use um, bubble cover or in use cover. It can be plastic or metal. Um, they make several different brands, but you're not allowed to use this uh, rainproof covers uh, anymore. Uh, so 316 uh, does require the in use cover to be installed. And so is that like a, it's like a plastic cover that you can kind of see through, but yep. stuff can get plugged in there, but it's still closed. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Yep. Um, weatherproof uh, enlisted boxes. So these are those NEMA 4 boxes. They've got, you can tell it's a NEMA 4 just because it has that little uh, uh, O-ring around the cover itself. So it has a nice tight seal to keep the dust from getting through. Um, and so, you know, this box in the far left corner looks a lot like the, uh, uh, the solar, um, control box cover. Basically it comes with an outlet so you can plug in your standard outlet that comes from that pump that comes from the manufacturer. So you don't have to do any rewiring or anything, basically bring your, and then it has a seal right next to it for sealing off the grommets from the tank into the, the, uh, enclosure itself. Um. And again, like I said, if the conduit goes into the ground, you should also have some seal, some duct seal or something to seal that moisture from the ground moisture getting into that, that box also. Um, the code does also say there should be a little weep hole in there. It says it can be uh, an eighth to a quarter of an inch. So even though these, these are uh, tight covers that are closed tightly, um, inevitably, you can still get moisture to develop in there through condensation or something, or if there's a, a leak because uh, the putty gets dry over time and it has a, a seal. Um, the, the code does require to have a little weep, weep hole in, installed. So a little, little hole, an eighth inch to a quarter inch hole, uh, usually in the bottom side, uh, to be installed in uh, a closed uh, junction box like this. Um, so that it just doesn't keep collecting water and wa more moisture over time. Um. There were a couple questions. I, I might interrupt you here. Just I, yep. I want to because so I don't they don't get lost in the chat. Um, you bet. <clears throat> one one was just a comment. Um, it, we talked about the pump has to have its own circuit, and the alarm has to be on a separate circuit. One comment was. <laughs> it's good to put that alarm on a circuit where you have lights or something. So you know if those lights aren't working that the alarm's not working either. So that was just a comment. Um, Definitely. And then um, there's another one here. It says with the direct burial of the UF cable it is a requirement to put some type of marker, uh, like how many inches above the cable, um, marking tape, et cetera, indicating that a cable is buried below. Is that is that a requirement on? Uh, the state of Wisconsin does not have that requirement, uh, nor does the uh, National Electrical Code. 
Um, there is a reference to marking tape of service conductors. So, you know, where you have, uh, you know, the service conductors coming in to feed a meter on your house and those kinds of things. So there are some references to marking tape for service conductors, oh, okay. but for, for branch circuits uh, coming out uh, to pumps and light fixtures and those kinds of things, there's no requirements for having any kind of marking tape or anything like that. All right. And then, Is it a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a good idea. Sure. Um, a question about the weep hole on the on boxes that are from a manufacturer. Are they generally already in that box? Is the weep hole something provided in that box? Yeah, some do and okay. some don't. Uh, okay. um, for example, if, if you look at this picture here in the bottom left hand corner, that that plastic box there, um, they have the big opening there, um, probably going into the side of the uh, the tank, right? So the cords and plugs can fit through there and that kind of thing. Yep. Um, and then, and then let's assume the bottom is going down. Um, well, it depends on the configuration here, but um, there's there's no holes in this particular plastic box anywhere. So other than the main conduit holes itself, um, and and these conduit holes will be sealed up anyway. Um, so there's really no place for the moisture to go once it does condensate, build up, build up in there, kind of, kind of thing. So some do, some don't. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a pat and yes or no answer. Yeah, sure. Yep. That's it for now. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a, an example. It looks like they had, it looks like an LB. It looks like somebody tried to use an uh, LB conduit fitting, um, conduit body. Um, that's the conduit bodies are not acceptable, um, like a two inch or two and a half inch L, uh, conduit body, LB and those kinds of things. Um, they are not, they don't have enough capacity. You know, when you go back into this junction box here, you can see how much capacity is in here for putting this, this circuit, this plate here for the receptacle and those kinds of things inside it um, and whatnot. So the LB body is not designed, you know, this is not designed to be stepped on. If somebody was to come over there and and step on it. Um, that's by code, it's supposed to be protected from physical damage. So you'd have to put some kind of barriers around it. Um, and you probably have to use schedule 80 versus schedule 40. Um, so there's all kinds of different things in the codes that restrict the use of, of a PVC LB or even a metal LB for that matter, um, just because of different things. Um, Looks like a pump cable size calculator. So again, this is probably using, there's a 3% voltage drop we were talking about earlier. Um, your load capacity, single phase, your amperage, um, and then it probably kicks out what size conductor um, yeah, is required you, for there. If you hit your enter button, there might be some, some little circles that come up. Oh, yeah. yep, there we yeah. go. All right, I like it. <laughs> So yep, you put your distance in there and then it'll tell you the size that needs to go, go in there. <clears throat> so going from 100 feet is a 12 gauge, but 115 feet is a 10 gauge. So a good example of, of how the distances will change the wire size. I like this uh, app, it's probably a, an Excel spreadsheet or something. Uh, it's uh, at, right at the bottom there, it says pagewire.com. Oh, wire nice. That's where yeah. it's at. Yep, it's online. Nice. <clears throat> All right. Um, so a good picture on the left here. So they've got an LB, or actually this could be an LL or an LR because it's coming out the side. Um, again, uh, the code says there's not enough space in this LB to put like cord connectors and receptacles and things inside this, this area. It needs to be a junction box. Um, in addition, if you look at the ground level here and the ground level here, you know, is this going to be buried or is it going to be right to the earth? Because um, not, not everything is just, this is not a waterproof box, right? So it's not going to keep the water out. Um, so there's a lot of things just going against this type of LL or LR box that's being used in this kind of scenario. And then you see the white plumbing pipe coming out, um, which is not rated for any kind of wiring at all. They have, they do have short elbows for, for PVC conduit. Um, so they do make some rather than long sweep elbows, they do make some short elbows. 
um, for PVC, even though it's kind of rare to find, but they are out there. Um, so big telltale there, you know, with the white PVC versus gray PVC, it's not the proper PVC installed there. Um, and I'm guessing they probably don't have any kind of a frost movement or earth movement protection there and probably don't have any uh, fitting at the bottom for uh, protecting the wires at the connection down below and those kinds of things. Um, on the right hand side, um, you notice the UF wire. So it does say 12-2 with ground UF, so underground feeder wire um, style. So that they come in all kinds of different colors. Um, you will see gray, you know, kind of a dark gray UF cable is pretty more of a common color, uh, but they do have white. I've seen yellow, I have seen orange UF wire, which is kind of confusing with the indoor wire, but uh, they do make different colors. You, you can especially ask them to make it, those kinds of things. And then it looks like the alarm circuit. So this looks like probably a low voltage alarm circuit. Um, and then it should say direct bearing. Uh, right here it says DIR, BUR. So that's direct burial cable okay. uh, on the side there. So it does say direct burial cable. Um, so that's what another key indicator that you want to look for uh, for the low voltage cabling to make sure it says DIR, BUR, or it'll be spelled out direct burial. Um, sometimes it'll just have the model numbers. And then if there's model numbers there as an inspector, um, we have to go do some research and go find the manufacturer and the, enter the model number and then find the specs and that kind of thing to figure it out um, if they don't know or if we need to verify and that kind of thing. But like in this particular case, uh, these two are acceptable um, to be installed for the power wire or the high voltage wire and the low voltage wire. There was a question about whether you can have these in the same junction box and those kinds of things. And the answer is the code says that as long as the uh, low voltage cable uh, outer casing is rated for the lowest voltage of the other cable next to it. So in other words, you have 120 volt, uh, let's assume it's 120 volt pump and you have 100. So this cable here is gonna have 120 volts in it. So they do make a low voltage cable that's 300 volt rated. Um, so if this was a 300 volt outer casing rated uh, cable, then it would be acceptable to be in the same junction box with the other cable itself. Um, so if it was passing through and those kinds of things. Now, if you're terminating, that's a different story. So if you're terminating, you have to have those terminations separated with a separator. So the cable itself can pass through and be in the same case, but if you're terminating, your terminations have to be separated. So if you're going to be splicing and doing those kinds of things in the same junction boxes, then you have to have a low voltage splicing compartment and then your line voltage splicing compartment. So that's where those, you'll see that some boxes have sleeves put in them and those kinds of things um, and whatnot. Um, sometimes you'll see, I think if we go back up to this one here, they'll have these terminals so they'll have the this high voltage kind of on the back side of this plate. So this plate is kind of separating the two. Um, so in this particular pre-manufactured pump housing junction box, the high voltage is on the back side of this plate uh, feeding this receptacle. And then on the front side of this plate is where you have these low voltage terminals. So this plate is providing that separation between the two line voltage and the uh, low voltage sides. They're not on the same side. The receptacle's on this side, but it, the connections and terminations are on the opposite side of this plate, if you will. While you have that up, um, Dan, okay, so let's say we don't have an outlet like that in our box. Let's say we just have a six by six junction box that we bought at Menards. And we're going to put a plug on the end of that cable that we're running from the house that we can put our piggyback in for the pump. Is that okay to do? Or do we need to have a plug like this? Right. So there's there's not a plug out there that I know that can connect to the UF cable. So, um, so as far as I know, the answer is no, because there's no, uh, there's cord connector ends, right, that go on the end of your cords. So there's a female and male cord connector that can plug in together, but that cord connector is not listed for the UF wire. So okay. you can't just connect to that female 
cord connector on the end of your UF cable because that's not what it's designed for. It may fit, you know, it may work, but it's not UL listed for that connection point. Got it. That makes sense. And that's why it goes to a receptacle scenario um, uh, for this particular case. Um, I mean, you could, if you had a large enough junction box, you could put like a little handy box, a little metal handy box, and have your UF wire going into the handy box and then have a like a single receptacle uh, inside that little handy box. You know, handy box is about three, in, you know, two inches by three inches. And so you could create your own receptacle inside that box for that cord connector to plug into, and that would be perfectly acceptable. Gotcha. So a, a little handy box with the receptacle on the end versus uh, a cord connector uh, used on a UF wire, that's not acceptable. Or not, it's not a listed product for that purpose. Right. Um, let's see what else. I think that's all we had there. So what I'll do is I'll bring over this Zoller. I, th I think this is a good example. Um, this is a, a quick box pump controller, kind of similar to what we just saw uh, on that other drawing. You know, it's basically a junction box um, with a receptacle on one side and uh, the low voltage terminals on this side, cord connectors. Um, it's all UL listed. It gives the a good description, kind of uh, how it comes together, where the seals go in here. Um, it doesn't mention, you know, to seal off the conduit going into the ground, um, but that's required by code and those kinds of things. But as far as everything else, it's it's pretty drawn out nicely here um, with the pump controls and things like that. Um, again, this is a type box. Looks like a NEMA type four box, but it's not a uh, it's not a direct buried box kind of thing. Uh, and then the last thing I just uh, what I thought I would throw out here is a lot of times a lot of people have been calling these LB uh, LBs as boxes, but they're actually defined as conduit body. So they're just extensions of the conduit itself to make a transition from, you know, vertical to horizontal or vice versa. Um, and they're not really designed like a junction box would be to house uh, other things uh, in them and those kinds of things. Um, but in the uh, LB boxes, if you do use LBs, I mean, certainly you can use the wires if you have your box inside your your um, actual um, tank itself. So if you, you transition from outside to inside the tank and then you have your junction box inside the tank, which is allowed. Um, you can certainly use this as a transition coming out of the ground and in, that's not a problem. And then there is enough sufficient space in here too to actually have um, uh, wire nuts and those kinds of things. So they, they're allowed to be a splice where you, if you want to have two wires and splice them together inside there, um, you can certainly do that, um, but they're not big enough to house a receptacle um, and those kinds of things in, in addition to the, the other stuff. Uh, but uh, these are conduit bodies as listed in the code, but they're not junk, considered junction boxes. Good to know. Um, the last thing I wanted to throw out there was, um, you know, a lot of people, we throw the UL name out there quite often and we go, well, it's, is it UL listed? And, and UL is only one of several different testing facilities out there that have testing. Uh, Intertech is another one uh, and those kinds of things. And they all have uh, several different things out there, but most of the products we see out there is UL listed. Um, if we go back to, let's see if I can bring that up here. I just do that. Let's just close it. Um, but the, um, here we go. 
So when we go to the manufacturer of that uh, box, whether it's a uh, PVC box or an LB conduit, you'll end up with something like this and it's got this big UL stamp listed on here um, that is UL listed. But you have to read the fine print as far as what it's listed for. And in this case, it says UL listed, uh, the US file number, category number, control number. And so in order to figure out what this thing's actually been tested for, because that's what UL is all about, is testing it for different uses. And this has not been tested to be used as a junction box with receptacle connectors, those kinds of things. That's not its design. And so if you go back and look at the UL listing, um, and if we go to, let's see if I get back to that. So if we just go to ul.com and under resources, um, on the right hand side, there's the certification database, this UL product uh, IQ. Um, you can visit that. It'll take you to the login page. It wants you to log in. So if you don't have a login, you'll have to log in. Um, but basically is um, when you're ready and you stick in some of these numbers, if you stick in this UL category number, there's currently 8,000 references to this category number. And one of them is I just put in the company name to narrow it down from the 8,000. So I got the, to the company name, Cantex, the category number, and the heading is non-metallic outlet boxes, but that's just the heading. If you read further into it, it says conduit bodies for PVC conduits. And you can find the model number of the particular LB that we were just talking about right there. So this says, so this is the listing, the UL listing for it to say what it's, it's actually in there for. And then when you drill down into it further, it'll, it'll give you the details of what the conduit body has been tested for. So, if it's a, a box extender, extensions, but well, we're dealing with conduit bodies. So then it goes into the details or the specifics of the, of the conduit body and what it's tested for and what it can be used for. Um, like in this particular, this particular case, um, it says the total cross-sectional area of the fill should not exceed the cross-sectional area of the conductor specified in the markings. So in, inside the LB, it'll say no more than three four aught conductors for a two inch LB. That's pretty common uh, because four aught aluminum is the largest size you might see for a residential um, 200 amp service. And so a two, two inch LB, it says four, three four aughts is the largest conductors that can be inside for the box fill of that. So that limits the, the size of the box fill capacity based on just having those three four aught conductors inside there based on what this UL listing is. So this UL listing is what limits the size or capacity of that box or of that conduit body, sorry. So anyway, um, just a quick rundown of where all this information kind of draws from. Yeah, that's good to have, <clears throat> very good to have. So yeah, we inspectors, we have a lot to, a lot <laughs> of resources we have to dig through just to make sure it's done right kind of thing. For sure. Okay. Um, well, that's about all I got. A few more questions, Dan. Um, so do you know what the NEMA rating is for inside the tank manhole? It, it, like if you put a box inside the tank manhole, is that a different NEMA rating? I think it might be explosion proof or something like that um, in that environment. Do you know if that's different? Correct. So, um, so in... So the code specifies that the the rating of the box itself has to be uh, per the rating of the environment, right? So if you're an explosion proof area, the, the catch 22 here is, is that what defines that rating or, or is it, a, so there is, you know, obviously as things digest, they create hydrogen, right? Methane gas and the methane gas is an explosive environment, but um, I don't believe that the tank itself is rated as an uh, explosive uh, environment itself because of the oh. um, okay. so, 
flows improve location or not. If, if, if an engineer or somebody was to define that, that tank location as an explosion proof area, then you would have to use explosion proof fittings and boxes and those kinds of things. Gotcha. Um, so they make a, a NEMA, um, an explosion proof uh, NEMA rated box, which is basically it's got, I don't know, there must be like 20 screws on the outside of the box and it has to have conduit. Then you have to have um, seal offs to seal off the conduits with actual explosion proof putty and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, but again, it draws back to who is designating that area as explosion proof or not. The, sure. the, the NEC code doesn't define it. It just says if it is explosion proof, you have to use explosion proof fittings. Gotcha. So right. if we use the NEMA 4X, the NEMA 4X is actually a, a vapor tight, uh, dust tight uh, environment when you use those seal offs, those seals and those kinds of things. But it's not explosion proof rated or anything gotcha. but it should try to mitigate those gases from building up in there and that kind of thing all right 4x all right, right. one more question here on the chat uh an L so this is he's asking for a clarification so an lb or a conduit body can be used as a splice point to connect an alarm float wire to the low voltage wire in a holding tank installation is that correct Right, you could use an use an LB as a as a splice point for putting wire nuts to put the yeah. low volts together. Yep. It's just when we do the pumps that it's something different. Correct. Yep. It's it's not so the, the housing's not allowed to have that receptacle. Uh, you know, there's not enough room to put like a receptacle in there with a little box and receptacle of, to plug in that pump. Kind of gotcha. Thing. All right, that's it for chat questions. So um, are there other questions out there? Does anybody have any photos that they wanna share and ask Dan, hey, is this is this okay? Or um, you're welcome to do that. I'm gonna, if it's all right with you, Dan, I'm gonna stop sharing your, oh, you already did. There you go. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so if there's anybody that, you know, wants to unmute yourself, ask a question, um, or, you know, like I said, share a photo or something, go ahead and go for it. 